Okay, so I think we're going to get started. So, uh, Gabe, thank you very much for session one and the speakers. I think it was excellent. Um, our second session is on the microbiome. And um, so, in just talking to Stuart and Devin and Bill out in the hallway, we were just kind of commenting that actually the field's been, been around uh, a long time, but really hasn't come into being recognized, I'd say, it's just maybe in the past decade. And, it, and it's partly just a blend of technology uh, and also, uh, it's, it's partly just technology. And just, you know, looking at different things now where you have a technology that can, uh, can, can unveil kind of a microbiome where before the culturing methods were just incredibly laborious. So it's, it's, it's entered in this whole new field. So we have three great speakers today. So Stuart Turvey, who's going to be our first speaker, and uh, Deb Money, our second speaker, and Bill Mullen. And, um, and so um, you have their bios, and so I'm not going to go through anything in detail, uh, but I'll just introduce our first speaker, who's Stuart Turvey. He's going to be uh, talking about exploring the relationship between early infancy gut microbiome alterations and childhood asthma. Please join me in welcoming Stuart. So thank you everyone, I'm happy to be here to talk a little bit about our recent work uh, looking at the microbiome and asthma. So in terms of disclosure, I've got no conflicts except to say that I didn't do this by myself. I see myself as the clinician and feel a bit like a fraud standing up here talking about sequencing and microbiology, but I'm pretty strong on the clinical questions. So I, I'm a pediatric immunologist and I care a lot about, about pediatrics and care a lot about asthma. But for those of you less familiar with, with this area, here's, here's a few things to think about. So asthma is the most common chronic disease of childhood. Asthma that begins in childhood generally is a lifelong problem and up to one in three Canadians will be diagnosed with asthma throughout their lifetime. For those of you who are inspired by dollars, I, I think it's remarkable that asthma accounts for 30% of Canadian healthcare billings to children. So clearly a, a, a big problem that we need to tackle. Why do people develop asthma? You know, the, the simple answer is it's genes in the environment. And uh, for, for many decades, people have been looking to dissect the environmental components uh, related to the development of asthma. And when you look at them, it becomes clear that uh, microbial exposure really is lies at the heart of some of the pathogens of this condition. So, for example, in affluent countries, uh, going to daycare or being born later in a large family uh, protects you from asthma. I mean, that, that's really a surrogate for early life infections. Uh, people who live on the farm are protected from asthma. Uh, having contact with animals is protected, in fact, some people argue the best thing you can do to protect yourself or your new child against asthma is to buy a dog. Um, and the list goes on. So the epidemiology had pointed us yeah, towards the idea that the microbes that we were exposed to, and particularly the, the gut microbiome, was likely to be important in the, in the pathogenesis of asthma. And with the recognition of this and the growth of the, of the field of um, microbiome research, combined with technology that allowed us to define uh, the microbial communities, we were able to start to embark on linking uh, gut microbiome to a variety of health outcomes. And, and here we're going to look at asthma because I think there's a lot of good reason why um, gut microbiome is likely to be important in asthma. So to embark on this, we actually partnered with an, another large study that I'm part of called the CHILD study, the Canadian Healthy Infant Longitudinal Development Study. Uh, this is a birth cohort study, a big ambitious birth cohort study that recruited over 3,000 pregnant women across four sites in Canada and then has been following up those families and the, the children until the children turn at least five years of age. And they've been um, looking at health outcomes, collecting biological samples, going to the homes and so on. So we were able to partner with CHILD to, to start to ask the question, how does gut microbiome relate to the development of, of asthma and allergy in children growing up in Canada today. And so to do that, uh, the, the child study was able to provide us with um, stool samples from these children when they were three months of age and when, when they were one, month, one year of age. 
and we were able to look at the gut microbiome and then relate that to clinical outcomes. And from a technical perspective, what we did was the standard approach, bacterial 16S ribosome RNA sequencing. Uh, we sequenced for, for this study at the v, V3 hypervariable region and then looked to define the community. Here's what we found. This figure made me very happy that it looked like it was going to work. So when we compared by principal component analysis the communities at three months and one year, they were very different. This wasn't a surprise. Uh, well established that over time the, the gut microbiome matures. But it made me very happy that it looked like we were on the, the right track and we might be able to find some important findings with, within this. So in the child study, uh, they have examined the children at age 1, age 3, age 5, and collected lots and lots of clinical, clinical data. So we were able to um, assign clinical phenotypes to, to the child study participants. And the clinical phenotypes we assigned were wheezing, simply asking the question, did your child wheeze uh, here within the first 12 months of life, or did a doctor hear wheezing, or did we hear wheezing? when we examine the child at age one. So, so we define them as being wheezy, yes or no. And then we also looked at their um, allergic sensitization, or atopy, by skin prick, test, skin prick testing. So anyone who's been to an allergist will have had the skin prick testing or the, or the, or the scratch testing, looking to, for sensitization to environmental allergens. So again, we were able to uh, define the children as being atopic or not based on the skin prick testing. And from that, there were four possible phenotypes these, these children could be assigned to. Some with here called controls, neither atopic and, and, and didn't wheeze. Some were atopic, some wheezed. And then a subset had both atopy and wheezing. And there, there are various clinical algorithms that allow us to predict asthma risk based on these early life clinical phenotypes. And the children with atopy and wheezing were at significant risk of having asthma at school age. So they're coloured in red, the wheezes uh, at lower risk, the A to B only, lower again, and then very low risk for the, the children who were the controls. And so it was based on these clinical phenotypes that then we started to look at the gut microbial composition. And you know, these data are always hard to show, but uh, when we looked closely, we saw that some of the minor community members seem to be quite different between the controls and the atopic wheeze group. I don't expect you to be, believe us based on this figure. But then we went ahead and quantified that by, by qPCR to actually quantify uh, those species and try and understand exactly what was happening. And I'll apologize this, because this data is not published. But I've taken the names of the bacteria so you'll just have to accept that there's different bacteria here. And, and what we saw was in the control group here on the left versus the atopic wheezes on the right, there was this significant difference in um, four uh, large community members. The other thing that I felt was in really important and interesting from this study was that the differences that we saw were quite marked at three months of age. It seemed to have really disappeared almost by age one. And, and that's, I think, an important reminder that it is very early in life when lots of the, the scene is set for lots of these diseases, but particularly very early in life um, for asthma and allergy. So, so what we were able to show was that there was these four bacteria uh, that seemed to be lower in the atopic wheeze group. In general, I don't really have time to show. We were able to then move and, and try and establish the causality of that uh, in a mouse model. And we showed that deliberate inoculation of germ-free mice with these four uh, bacterial species that were lower in the, the children with atopic wheeze was able to protect from experimental induced asthma, suggesting that uh, the absence of these, these four species was likely pathological in, in the development of asthma for the children. So as I get the wind-up signal, I'll conclude by, by saying that I think what we were able to show was that early life microbial dysbiosis, so differences uh, in, in the <coughs> microbiome, were associated with an enhanced risk of asthma and allergy in, in the children we studied. I think quite striking and quite important for this study was the importance of that, that 
first hundred days of life, the first three months or so, where there seemed to be a real critical window uh, where the effects of the dysbiosis were mediated. And from our data, it seemed that uh, those differences uh, waned and that that window perhaps closed by the age of one year. So now, you know, as a clinician, I'm thinking, what's the, the relevance of this? What can we do next? Can we use this data uh, to develop preventative strategies? And I think it's, it's clear that when we're starting to think about ways to potentially correct dysbiosis, maybe even prevent the development of asthma and allergy, any interventions will be, have, have to be very early in life. And uh, uh, I think what we're talking about is in that first few months of life, uh, which, which raises sort of important ethical and, and logistic challenges. But I think it opens a window to a new way to address this important burdens of disease. So I'll finish again by saying, I didn't do this myself. We had a big, big team involved in looking at these data. And I think we're really excited about what we find, found and grateful for funding from CHR and, and um, Genome BC for supporting the work that we've done so far. So thank you.